Good evening, and thanks for watching. My name is Laren Johnson. I'm Lisa Burton. And tonight's episode on Focus on Communication, we'll be discussing technology. Technology is forever changing uh, with new and innovative ways to learn and communicate, but tonight we'll focus on journalism, language, and this new thing called Skyping. To help us out, we'll be inviting Heidi Schlump, Associate Professor of Communication, to speak with us about the current shift from traditional print to online journalism. And we'll end with Dr. Denise Hatton, Professor of Spanish, to talk about technological bilingual learning. So we've got a lot to look forward to this evening. We sure do. So I would like to introduce Heidi Schlump. Heidi's an Associate Professor of Communications at Aurora University. And she has a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Notre Dame in American Studies with an emphasis on journalism and history. She also has her Master's from Northwestern, Univers from Northwestern University Seminary in Theological Studies. Heidi brings 20 years of journalism experience to her classroom and we're very excited to have her. Hi, Heidi. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, thanks for having me. So let's get right into things, shall we? Yes. So journalism and the communication have become increasingly technological. With that in mind, what direction do you see journalism going? Well, I like to think of journalism as telling true stories. And I think there'll always be a need for storytelling, no matter how much technology changes. I sometimes define journalism as the gathering and disseminating of socially relevant information to help people make sense of their world. So people still need to make sense of their world. It's just the gathering and the disseminating of that information is changing very rapidly. Mm -hmm. I, I like that. That's a good point. Yeah. So how do you feel the telecommunication companies are adjusting to that shift? Well, I mean, for telecommunication companies and any other business that focuses on technology, this is an exciting time. Things are changing fast, and many of those companies are changing very quickly, too, many of them being very successful uh, when that happens. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good news, then. Well, then, taking it down a level, how do you think that the local news and even student publications have fared during this shift? Well, I think... Um, so the news business in general has, was somewhat slow to get on the technological bandwagon initially. So as things were moving online, many news publications, especially those that were involved with print, were very slow to think that this new thing would, called the internet was really going to stick around and they thought print would be around forever. So um, they were relatively slow to get started, but once they started getting on board, they were much uh, quicker in terms of of uh, catching up. So there was a little catching up to do, but now I think most publications are doing quite well. What started out in initially is what we call shovelware, which is they just took the same content or information that they would have normally put in print and just threw it up on the internet without taking into account that uh, it's a different medium, the audience has different needs and interests. So today, the um, Shovelware is not the way uh, publications uh, have an online presence. They're much more keyed into what's different about the internet. Mm -hmm. So with that said then, on that same level with the local news and even student publications, then are they leading this shift to online journalism or are they still kind of lagging behind? Yeah, so you know, our student newspaper here at Aurora University is a completely online mm -hmm. newspaper. We don't print it. It's, you won't find it lying around the campus because it's only online. The Spartan Chronicle .com. Um, but I will say when I proposed that idea two years ago at a conference of media college media advisors, it would it is it was only one of two student publications that was completely online. Oh. So most student newspapers do have an online version, but it supplements their print version. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say that student newspapers are leading, but granted, student journalists are younger. They're more technologically adept. They're more used to using the technology. So in many ways, they're, um, they're, they're not fearful of embracing new technology the way some people who work in journalism were initially. So that also speaks to the differences in how people are consuming media. The demand for media in a different way, uh, delivered in a different way, is changing as well. What other observations have you seen on, on that front? Mm -hmm. 
Well, the way, I mean, most of us consume our media online now. Um, I'm a print journalist. I still write for a number of publications that are in print, but I still consume the majority, in fact, probably 90% of my news I get online as well. So um, there's two different ways of consuming information or news online. We have scanners who are kind of jumping around and clicking and only reading brief little tidbits of everything. And then we also have people who really want to go into depth. So they might have even seen something on television and they want to know more about it. So they go online and they like to use different links or other um, places you can go online to go really in depth. So when you write for that, uh, for that medium, you have to consider both of those audiences. You have to be brief so that you can attract the scanners, but then you have to provide a lot of links, a lot of background material, multimedia that the in-depth people might want. Would you be willing to venture a guess on how that is split, the two groups? Oh, the uh, the uh, the in depth versus the scanners. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't. You know, it's not like people are either one or the other. You go to the internet with different uh, needs depending on what you're get, what you're looking yeah. for. If you're just checking your email and you just hop over to Yahoo News to find out, you know, if anything big happened, or you're just checking the scores, you're a scanner. But if you go online and you're researching something, or like I said, it's something that you have some deep interest in, you'll be a more in depth person. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So along the same lines, how do our social networking sites like Facebook or Twitter play into the equation? Well, social networking um, really is changing the way people consume news. So it used to be that an editor of a publication or of the nightly newscast decided what were the most important stories for the con mm. news consumers to, to see or read that day. Now people can self-select. Uh, somebody calls it the daily me. Um, and they use sure. their Facebook or their Twitter feeds as a place to get the, only the news that they're interested in. Right. They follow the publications they're interested in or the people they're interested in who will post things of, um, of those things that they care about. So it narrows the, the news that we consume. So if we're not interested in politics, we can kind of shield all of that out and just get sports news or vice versa. Mm -hmm. Sure. It sure seems to give the consumer a lot more control. Yeah, a lot of power. So then do you see print journalism becoming obsolete in the near future? And if so, what's the time frame that you would give it? Well, um, I'm not going to make any predictions um, <laughs> while I'm being taped, but um, <laughs> I'd like to believe that print will never be obsolete. Um, even with uh, e-readers, there are people who prefer to have a book. Um, there's certain things we do like to read in print. Mm -hmm. So I think print will still be around. That said, it is decreasing, and it will... Um, increasingly serve a very specific role and people will get more of their daily and everyday news online. Mm -hmm. So then with that said, how have you as a professor changed or adapted your curriculum to, to fit with today's standards of journalism? Okay, well I teach, uh, you know, writing for communication and journalism classes as well as classes where we study these phenomena. Mm -hmm. In the writing classes, I still think it's important to teach the basics Everyone still needs to know how to write basic journalistic copy, um, whether you're writing for multimedia online or for a print publication, you need to know how to do that. But like you said, I have had to change my curriculum and every semester it seems like I'm adding more and more new things so that my journalism students now know how to tweet a story and blog a story as well as write it for print or mm -hmm. for broadcast. That you've given us a lot to think about. Thank you so much for your time and for joining us today. Thank you so much. We're happy to have you. So the next, we'll talk about uh, the new telephone, Skype. Lisa, you've been doing some research on this. Can you tell us what exactly is Skype? I have, and I've learned a, a lot about it. It's simply put, Skype is a method of communi communicating over the internet. Um, what I did learn were a lot of new uses I wasn't previously aware of um, through Skype, we not only have voice calling, but uh, audio conferencing, file transfer, a simpler, cheaper, easier, faster way to file transfer, video conferencing, and video chat. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what's amazing, Lauren, is that there's currently about 700 million Skype users. Wow. It, it's, no, it's a lot, and, and when you think about it, it's no surprise. Skype is user-friendly, mm -hmm. it's easy to get, mm -hmm. um, and I think what really pleases people is it's usually free. There's a few yeah. feed <laughs> options, but for the most part, you can download and start using this at no cost. Yeah, that could come in handy really for anyone. It then. certainly does, yeah. and most recently, iPhone released video, video calling. Mm -hmm. 
And Skype became a huge international voice carrier, in fact, the hugest, mm -hmm. with about 35 million simultaneous users. Oh, wow. Um, online. Okay, so, so then how has Skype made this generation of users use their product? Well, and I think this is the exciting part, especially for educators. Skype gives a student immediate exposure to new cultures, new languages, new ideas even. And visual learning tends to be more memorable, more impactful for a student. Um, classrooms anywhere around the world can just be connected. And this type of, the, of communication really has the potential to, to revolutionize online education. Yeah, it really, really does. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, Lisa. Absolutely. For more information on using Skype in your home, you can visit their website, skype.com. Okay, our last guest is here to talk to us about the newest trend in bilingual learning. Yes, we have Dr. Denise Hatcher, Associate Professor of Spanish at Aurora University. Um, she's been teaching Spanish for over 17 years and prides herself on being a passionate supporter of bilingual education. So we're very excited to talk to her. We welcome Dr. Hatcher. Welcome. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. So, um, you're not a native Spanish speaker. I'm not a native Spanish speaker. How long have you been speaking Spanish? Since I was in seventh grade. Oh. So, about 30 years. That's amazing. It really is. About 30 years. So, then going on to, to, into our topic, um, there's a new trend in learning languages, and that's by way of computer programming, um, such as Rosetta Stone. Um, what's your take on these types of programs? How do they compare to traditional language learning? It's a great question. I think that there are so many different learning styles. I think it's going to depend on the independent learner, meaning for some people, if they're very disciplined mm -hmm. and they can work without any feedback or with you know technology, if they're comfortable using it, it's a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. When we first added the Spanish major here about five years ago, our first declared Spanish major subscribed to Rosetta Stone in Chinese. So we tried it in class. It's very repetitive if you do very well memorizing dialogues, doing some of the older technologies where you don't have someone standing in front of you correcting you. If you're ready to do, you know, rote memorization, if you're mm -hmm. able to really kind of focus on something, it's a wonderful teaching tool. Not everyone learns that way, right. but it's nice to have another option with regards to learning language. Mm -hmm. That's true. So while you respect it as an option, do you fall a little bit short of calling it the new trend? I don't think it's ever going to work for everyone. Sure. I think it works for a certain type of learner, a very disciplined person who really has a very, a very self-motivated reason for learning a language. If there's someone who needs that feedback, if there's someone that needs that constant reassurance, mm -hmm. it might not work for him or her. But for a lot of people, it's working. The sales are doing well. It's a very popular program. Sure. You hear commercials for it all the time. And yeah. I'm assuming that they're selling it to keep paying for more commercials. <laughs> you, you, it, sure, it sure seems to be so. And uh, have you heard an increasing amount of your students take advantage or at least try it? Do you see it increasing? I don't know if it's increased. I think there's been a steady flow of questions that I've received over the years. I'm interested in learning another language, Dr. Hatcher. What do you think? Sure. We'll try it. And it's very nice because I know Rosetta Stone used to have an introductory period that was free. Okay. So instead of having to make the That's big helpful. investment... It really worked well that someone could try it and see whether or not it was working for him or her and then decide to buy the program. I see. Okay. So do you think that overall, you talk about the difference between you know having a self-motivated person using mm -hmm. Rosetta Stone and maybe a person that needs an instructor on the other side of the scale, but do you think that using this program can be as effective as learning traditionally? Oh. We could talk about that for hours. That's such a good question. That's such a good question. I think it really depends on the learner. Mm -hmm. I don't want to. I don't want to say that it's going to work well for everyone, but I think for some people it's going to work very well. You know, if you really want to travel to Argentina and speak Spanish in six weeks or six months or something, and you've got that internal motivation, that intrinsic motiva motivation, mm -hmm. it's going to be great. If you're someone that you know, sometimes you get a little overwhelmed or get a little sidetracked. It might not be as effective a teaching tool, but it's got wonderful potential. Okay. Yeah. Tell so, us your thoughts on the free translation websites, the, the Google Translate. If you're familiar with the language, they're very good. Okay. If you're not familiar with the language, you can come up with some very interesting translations. Hmm. 
My favorite is that, to, for example, Spanish has the verb divertirse, to enjoy oneself, to have fun. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people want to break down the verb, you know, word by word, and they want a verb for have. Oh, so they yeah. use tener, mm -hmm. and then fun, divertido. Tengo divertido. No, it's, you know, you have to, it's like using a dictionary. When I, I taught see. high school before coming to you, we used to give practice exercises using a dictionary. And students didn't understand that you needed to read through all of the d definitions, all mm -hmm. of the translations in order to pick the best one. It's nice that they're out there. I love them. I love them because now with what I do is I'll come up with my list and I can go to Google, Google and I translate and I've got them all there. And although I do love print media and I do love my newspaper, I love Google Translator because I'm not going <laughs> through my dictionary. Yeah. So it I, is I think really they're convenient. a great tool. Yeah. And I know sometimes, you know, I, I remind my students that not everyone can know every single word. Yeah. And it's wonderful when you're sitting in class and someone says, you know, profesora, puedo, and they take out their cell phone and they've mm -hmm. got internet yeah. on there. I can tell you the word 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. How awesome is that? Instead of having to say, okay, I'll have the word ready for next class period. Sure. I was just looking right there. earlier today on my phone for star fruit in Espanol. I couldn't find it, but... <laughs> So it's a great tool if used responsibly. <laughs> right. I, think that, I think that's true. And star food probably doesn't translate because it's probably not something that you find in Spanish-speaking countries yeah. yet. Give it time. <laughs> Give it time. Okay. We'll see. So um, what situations do you think that these sites might be helpful? The Google Translate? Yeah. Or I think it can really help the student who is disciplined and you know might be working on something and is willing to go back and find the translated things. Something that, at the beginning student, something that makes me sad is when a student progresses through the levels and they're still writing in English and then they think they can put it into google.com mm -hmm. okay. and it'll spit the whole thing back. Yeah. At that level, you should be training yourself to think in the second language, not just still relying on that first language as a crutch and then yeah. using a technological I think tool. That's one of the hardest in order to, and it is hard, it is hard. Yeah. But once you push yourself over that hump, the language learning just goes that much more quickly. Mm -hmm. Well, we thank you so much for We're coming. Skyping in class tomorrow. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> We're putting it, putting it all, to putting to everything to together. To Who are you speaking to in Madrid? Casey Walker, our first exchange student to um, Universidad de Juan Carlos, is going to Skype one of her friends who's back in Madrid. That's amazing. It is exciting. Have everything together. <laughs> Have you done exciting. that before? No. Nope. First time. It just yeah. shows how we continue to adapt, mm -hmm. change, and technology things. is always at the you know at the hub. Do you have students that you sense have a fear to go to technology for their learning, even even to use the tools? I think, our, I think our younger students are much more adept at it, mm. and I think one of the advantages of the social networking is they're not afraid of things. And so my own daughter, who's 14, will go to googletranslate.com and not think anything of it, mm -hmm. whereas it took mom a little bit longer to feel comfortable doing something like that. Okay. Sure, that makes sense. And are the same options of social networking websites available in, in Spanish and other languages? It's wonderful. I have friends all over the world because I'm able to keep in contact with them via Facebook or via the Internet. But Very it's really nice. fun that, you know... I've got friends in other countries, and we don't have to wait for that snail mail to arrive right. or pay pay postage. We can just, you know, go online and absolutely. Just another, just another example of the flattening and the bringing people together mm -hmm. that communication has a way of doing yes. with technology combined with our communication principles. Mm -hmm. Everyone is together. Everyone yeah. is bound. Everyone's connected. Very nice. Yeah. Okay. Well, we thank you for your input, Dr. Thank you Hatcher. for having me. Appreciate thank you being you for here. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. So it's, it's apparent that in our ever-changing society, it's very important that we stay involved in technological conversations. While they make our lives easier, though, it is important to remember that things like social networking sites are not always reliable, and caution should always be exercised when sharing any information over the Internet. So a, a big thank you again to both of our guests for stopping by to talk to us tonight and to all, from all of us here at Focus on Communication, thank you for watching. Thank you. Good night. Good night.